Exodus chapter 8. We're not going to read all of the verses that we're going to consider this morning. Um, this morning we're going to start, for the next couple of weeks, we're going to consider um, more of an overview of these plagues as we uh, go through them. We're not going to look at each pl one plague each week. We'll just do an overview as we continue through the ten plagues of Egypt. And so the next two weeks, I'd like to preach on learning from, or lessons from the plague. So uh, Exodus chapter 8. And we'll read verse 16 down to the end of the chapter this morning, but we'll continue with chapter 9 a little bit as well when we look at God's word today. Exodus chapter 8, verse 16. And the Lord said unto Mo Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out thy rod and smite the dust of the land, that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so, for Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and smote the dust of the earth, and it became lice in man and in beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there were lice upon man and upon beast that then the magicians said unto Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. The Lord said unto Moses, rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. Lo, he cometh forth to the water and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. Else if thou wilt not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies upon thee and upon thy servants and upon thy people and into thy houses. And the houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies and also the ground whereon they are. And I will sever in that day the land of Goshen in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. To the end thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. And I will put a division between my people and thy people. Tomorrow shall this sign be. And the Lord did so, and there came a grievous swarm of flies into the house of Pharaoh, and into his servants' houses, and into all the land of Egypt. The land was corrupted by reason of the swarm of flies. And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron and said, Go ye, sacrifice to your God in the land. And Moses said, It is not meet so to do, for we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, and will they not stone us? We will go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God, as he shall command us. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go, that ye may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only ye shall not go very far away, entreat for me. And Moses said, Behold, I go out from thee, and I will entreat the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people tomorrow. But let not Pharaoh deal deceitfully any more in not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord, and the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and he removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. There remained not one. And Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also. Neither would he let the people go. Let's ask the Lord to bless his word. Our Father, I thank you, Lord, for this time that we get to spend in your word this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the lessons that we learned from these plagues that were sent on the land of Egypt. And I pray, Lord, this morning, as we just take this um, overview, uh, perspective of, this, of these passages of Scripture, I pray, Lord, that our hearts will be stirred as we consider what you did in letting Israel go and setting them free from Egypt, because it's a picture, Lord, of what you did for us when you saved us from this world and how you uh, saved us from the bondage of sin. And we're so thankful, Lord, for the salvation we have through Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. Reinhold Mesner was a skilled mountain climber, and he was recognized as the best in the world. And he was one of the two men who first climbed Mount Everest without using bottled oxygen. 
And Mesner then decided that doing it with a partner was not good enough, and he went back and he did it all alone. Well, someone asked him, why do you do it? Why do you climb this mountain? He said, because at the top, all the lines converge. Why did he climb? Because he liked the view from the top. He liked the perspective he had looking down on the world from the top of Mount Everest. Well, this morning, I'd like to climb the mountain, if you will, and get the view from the top. We're going to get a broader perspective of what's happening in our text as we think of these plagues in Egypt. In our series, we are seeing now God's act of judgment on the nation of Egypt as the plagues come down and as the hand of God strikes the nation of Egypt. And it's one of the most famous Bible stories that you've ever heard. Uh, it's one of the most well-known stories in the world, the 10 plagues on Egypt. Uh, movies have been made of it. Books have been written about it. But I wonder today, have you ever taken a step back and considered what the lessons are to be learned from the plagues of Egypt? This morning and next Sunday, Lord willing, we're going to take that step back and see, not zero in on a specific portion, but from a bird's eye view, we'll get the perspective We'll learn some lessons from these plagues of Egypt. So what do you learn from it? Well, number one, how can you read of the, the ten plagues and not see, number one, the greatness of God? The greatness of God. The plagues showed God's power. They showed God's majesty, he, His greatness. You know that what God did in Egypt is something that only God could do. Something that no man could do, no other gods of this world could do. Only God could do it. And in our text, we see those looking on, regardless of their religious background or their education level, regardless of their previous preconceived notions, they could do nothing but admit that this was the finger of God. Do you see that in the text? Up to this point in Exodus chapter 8, the servants of Pharaoh, his magicians, his sorcerers, they have been copycats. They have been able to duplicate the miracles that God is performing through Moses. But not anymore. In verse, at chapter 8, verse number 17, it says, And they did so, for Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and smote the dust of the earth, and it became lice in man and in beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And notice verse 18. And the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there were lice upon man and upon beast. Then the Egyptians said unto Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. This is something God is doing. This is something that the Almighty is doing. They could not do anything but acknowledge that this was God's greatness. You know that God is great. You know that there's nothing in this world that compares to God. Wonders, miracles, these things that God is doing, this was something that only God can do. When the Israelites, after they're delivered in Exodus chapter 15, and they look back on the Red Sea and look back on the ten plagues, they sing a song in Exodus 15 verse 11, and they say, Who is like unto thee, O Lord? among the gods, who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. Psalm 136 verse 4 says to give thanks to him because he alone is the God who doeth great wonders. And perhaps today you feel overwhelmed. You feel like the object in front of you is too large. It's, uh, you're trapped. You're stuck. You have no victory, no purpose. You can't see at all how you could ever be delivered. It's never hopeless because God is great. God is greater than our problems. God is greater than our obstacles. God can do anything. It is not a question of what God can do because God is unlimited in His power. He can do all things. There is nothing that God cannot do. God's the God alone that doeth wonders. You know, that, and when you look at the Exodus and the plague, some will teach that each plague 
was a specific judgment on a specific God in the nation of Egypt. I don't know if that's the case or not. I, I really don't know if each plague was, was aimed specifically at one specific Egyptian God, but I can tell you this. The gods of Egypt, they were overcome. They were powerless against Almighty God. And specifically during the last plague, the death of the firstborn, God said in Exodus 12, 12, against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. And you go through these plagues and you see the things that Egypt worships being overcome. They worship the Nile River. They worship the river. They looked at it as their source of life. God turned the river, the water into blood. The Egyptians, they actually, uh, this is the strangest thing. Maybe they've been to a few church picnics or something. I don't know. But the Egyptians, they liked frogs. I don't understand that. But uh, apparently the goddess of fertility, uh, the goddess of the resurrection and childbirth named Heket, had the head of a frog. And a frog was the symbol of fertility in Egypt. Well, God, ju God judged them with frogs. And there was nothing that their false god, Heket, could do about it. And in the plague that we just considered, the plague of lice, I don't know. I, you pick which plague would be your least favorite. I don't know which one. I, I don't think Duran would mind this one. This would probably be his favorite one. But me personally, I don't know how much I'd like the plague of lice. But lice went through it all the land of Egypt. And it was a judgment on the Egyptian god Set as they smote the dust of the earth. And the dust of the earth, Set was the god of the desert. And God took the dust of the desert and turned it into lice and sent it into the land. And you think of lice and you realize the Egyptians in their false worship were so concerned with their cleanliness. They would have hated the lice. But their God was unable to stop them, was unable to help them. Once again, the God of Israel had proven to be the God of gods, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He'd proven himself to be the great I am. And he showed it here in the Exodus. Do you know that God has power? Do you know that God is able? Our world today is just like Pharaoh was, isn't it? They don't believe that God has power. They don't believe that God can do anything. They don't know the Lord. They don't fear the Lord. They don't believe in his power. They're questioning his existence, doting his ability, doting his strength. But just as God showed himself strong in the past, God can show himself strong today. In fact, he wants to show himself strong today. All he needs is a heart that's perfect towards him. That's what he says in 2 Corinthians 16, verse 9. It says, for the eyes of the Lord are running to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Is your heart perfect toward him? God wants to show you his power. God wants to do something great for you. Let the Exodus remind you that God can do anything. You can trust in his power. The Exodus teaches us of the power of God, and we're just doing an overview this morning, remember? So secondly, as we continue, the Exodus teaches us the holiness of God. It teaches us the holiness of God. It teaches us the doctrine of separation. It tells us that God is separate, and he wants his people to be separate. Uh, you notice that in these plagues, in the first three they affected everyone. The blood turned to water, that affected everyone. The frogs, they went everywhere, including where the Israelites dwelt. The lice went everywhere, including where the Israelites dwelt. I really wish that one had have been separated. But anyways, it's when you get to the next one, the fourth one, when God says, now I'm going to put a line of distinction. Now I'm going to separate from my people and the people of Egypt. That's what it told us in Exodus chapter 8 as we read down through those verses. It said in verse 23, and I will put a division between my people and thy people 
Tomorrow shall this sign be. He said in verse 22, I will sever in that day the land of Goshen in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. To the end thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. And think of it, God's people, they did not face the swarms of flies. They did not face, and later on, they did not face the loss of their cattle. They did not face the boils or the hail or the locusts. While Egypt was covered in darkness, the Bible tells us the Israelites had light in their dwelling. Why? Because they were different. Because they were distinct. Because they were set apart by God for himself. They were different than the people of the world. God had a special relationship with them. He was not ashamed to be called their God, for he had prepared for them a city. And so they were separated from the people of Egypt. When the plagues came on Egypt, Israel received blessing. While the Egyptians suffered the consequences of sin, Israel experienced salvation. While the Egyptians were trapped with no way out, the Israelites crossed through the waters of the sea. While the Egyptians endured God's wrath, Israel enjoyed God's grace. And Christian, let me remind you, you've been separated as well. God's called you onto himself, called you from among this world. And if you're born again by the Spirit of God, you're separated, called out part of the church. You know what the word church means? It's the word ecclesia. And I guess in adult Sunday school class, you've been learning about the church. So you would have just learned this recently. The word church, ecclesia, means a called out assembly. You've been called out of this world, separated from this world. And while the world is under condemnation, we have passed, the Bible says, from death unto life. And there is no more condemnation. No condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. While the world will suffer the consequences of sin or is suffering from the consequences of sin, we enjoy God's favor for the curse has been lifted. While the bondage, while the world is in bondage, dead in trespasses and sins, we've been saved, rescued, redeemed, given new life in Christ. We're separate from the world, different from the world, no longer part of the world. You know where you're finding the world starting to get a little strange? Where you're wondering why you don't fit in like you thought you would? You realize you weren't supposed to fit in. Not with the world. You're different than them. You're not supposed to be like them. The Bible says you're a new creation, a new creature in Christ. God separated you to himself. And the fact that he has separated us, that he is holy and he separated us onto himself, it ought to cause us to live a separated life. You see in chapter 8 that God separates the Israelites. And then as you keep going down chapter 8, it seems that Pharaoh is finally giving in. It seems that way. I mean, it it seems that way about 10 times, and he never does. But anyways, seems like he's giving in. And he says, okay, Moses, come here. Let's make a deal. Because it's always good to negotiate with the devil. No, it's not. <laughs> but he says, let's make a deal. Let's, let's, let's say here, you, you guys can worship God, but you got to stay in the land. You got to stay in the land. Don't, don't leave Egypt to do it. But the Exodus tells us the holiness of God. And if we are to worship the Lord, then we can't do it in Egypt. We can't do it in this world. And that we can't do it from a worldly mindset. If we're to be worshipers of God, we need to maintain our separation from the world. For Moses, it was not an option in Exodus chapter 8 to worship God in the land of Egypt. He said, we'll sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes. Will they not stone us? And he says in verse 27, Exodus 8, 27, we will go three days journey into the wilderness 
and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he shall command us. I like that. How far away did they need to go? Three days journey. You know how separated you need to be from the world? Three days journey. The death and resurrection of Christ. Three days journey. He died and he rose again the third day. When he died and rose again and we, and we as Christians trusted him as Savior and, and we identify with him in his death and his resurrection, we're three days separated. Three days journey from the world. We've been put on a new place, put in a new plane, put in a new, in a new reality. In the Bible, Egypt is always a picture of the world. Always a picture of the worldly system. Always a picture of the worldly ways. And we are to be separated from it. To be worshipers of God. Don't worship God and have fellowship with the world at the same time. You can't worship God from inside the land. God said, Pharaoh said, go sacrifice to God. You'd think that's great, right? That's exactly what we wanted. Uh, we wanted freedom of worship. We wanted freedom to serve God as we please. We wanted freedom to sing to Him our songs of praise. Freedom to live for Him. Except as Psalm 137 verse 4 says, How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? How can we sing the Lord's song inside the world? How, you can't worship God from the land of Egypt. God's called us out. Now, we understand we're in the world, yes, but we're not of the world. God says, come out and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and I will be unto you a God, your God, and ye shall be unto me my people. We're to come out from among them and separate ourselves. Moses refused to worship God from inside the land of Egypt. He said, we got to be separated. Three days journey. C.H. McIntosh puts it this way. Three days journey, nothing less than this can satisfy faith. The Israel of God must be separated from the land of death and darkness and the power of the resurrection. There could be no tabernacle, no temple, no altar in Egypt. It had no sight throughout its entire limits for aught of that kind. Exactly so it is now. The believer, believer must know where the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ have forever set him, ere he can be an intelligent worshiper, an acceptable servant, or an effective witness. Our text reminds us that to be true worshipers, we must be separated. You know that the world and the Christian has nothing in common. Nothing in common. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. Pharaoh's next ploy is, okay, well, go, but don't go too far away. In other words, you know, it, yes, fellowship with God, be separate, but don't be too separate, you know, don't be too like God, don't be too different from this world. Try to fit in a little bit. Don't be a fanatic, you know. No, we need to come all the way out for God. We read in the adult Sunday school class this morning, What's the standard of holiness and what's the standard of worldliness? Well, it's simple. What we want is of the Father. Anything that's worldly is not of the Father. 1 John 2.15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father but is of the world. we got to say goodbye to the world. Anything that's not like the Father. How do you know what the Father is like? Well, through the Bible and through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Savior reveals to us the Father. We're to be like Jesus. Anything that's not like Jesus, we need to deal with. Anything that's not like Jesus, we need to, we need to get out of our lives. We need to be more like Him as we worship our Savior. We must say goodbye to the world. It teaches us the doctrine of separation. It teaches us the holiness of God as we think of the Exodus. One more thing this morning. We have three this morning. We've got four next week that we'll learn from the Exodus. 
But as you look at the opening verses of chapter 21, the emphasis that I, I want you to consider is we just get the bird's eye view is you learn the authority of God. You learn the authority specifically of God's word. When God speaks, he means it. When God speaks, he is accurate. When God speaks, we need to listen. After the plague of flies, when Pharaoh tried to compromise, the, the next plague is the death of the Egyptian cattle. It's announced in chapter 9, verses 1 to 5. But notice with this plague, not only does God tell Pharaoh what will happen and where it will happen, but in this instance, he goes so far as to say when it will happen. Look at verse 5. And the Lord, chapter 9, verse 5. And the Lord appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord shall do this thing in the land. And chapter 6 said, And the Lord did that thing on the morrow, and all the cattle of Egypt died, but the cattle of the children of Israel died not one. It happened exactly as God said it would. God spoke the details, and the details happened exactly as God said they would happen. And all throughout these plagues, that just keeps happening, doesn't it? God speaks, and it happens just as God says. It always happens exactly as God's word says. God's word keeps just being fulfilled over and over again. And at some point, at some point you would think that a man as wise as Pharaoh, I'm going to assume that he had education. I'm going to assume that he was a man that was instructed in all the ways of the Egyptians, just like Moses was. I'd assume that he was a man that was well-learned and distinguished. You'd think that this man would have enough common sense to say, okay, God said it. It's happened. At some point, I need to submit to God's word. At some point, I need to realize that this is going to happen and act accordingly. But we see in the text that, Mo, that Pharaoh never reveres God's word. In Exodus chapter 9, when the next plague comes, when the boils come, they come once again, just as God said they would. And then in, right in, they come right in the presence of Pharaoh. Pharaoh sees it, and he sees it happening and knows that God is acting. So you'd think in verse 13 he'd be ready to listen when Moses talks about now sending plagues on his heart and on his servants' hearts. And he tells them of the next plague, the pestilence, and how tomorrow in verse 18, the hail would come. Hail like, unlike any hail that Egypt had ever seen before. God said, listen, Pharaoh, this is what I'm going to do next. I'm going to send hail through all the land of Egypt. Any cattle that's left that's in the field is going to die. But Pharaoh, I'm telling you this so that you can actually do something about it. So you can take your cattle and put them in the barn. So you can put them somewhere safe. And Pharaoh has no fear of God. And the Bible tells us in verse number 19, Moses said, Send therefore now and gather thy cattle and all that thou hast in the field. For upon every man and beast which shall be found in, one, in the field and shall not be brought home, the hail shall come down upon them and they shall die. And then it says, He that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses. And he that regarded not the word of the Lord left his servants and his cattle in the field. What was the difference between those who survived and those who died? The difference was what they did with the word. Those that listened to it and those that refused it. God said what he was going to do. God didn't lie. God never lies. God is truth. He always speaks the truth. God always does exactly as he says he's going to do. The question is, will you listen? Will you obey it? Will you revere God's word. Our Savior told the story. The children sing the song about it of the wise man and the foolish man. 
So simple. The wise man built his house upon the rock. That makes sense. The rains came down, the floods came up, but the house on the rock stood firm because it's on a rock. The foolish man built his house on the sand. That seems silly, doesn't it? Very foolish. The rains came down, the floods came up, the house on the sand went splat because, well, he, he built it on the sand. Of course that was going to happen. But what's the difference? What's it telling us? Well, the wise man, Jesus says, is a picture of him who hears these sayings of mine and does them. He's the one that built his life on the rock. He's the one that when the floods came and the storms rise, he's going to be okay because he's built his life on God's word. But the foolish man, he's the one that built his life on the sand. He's the one that Jesus said, here's these sayings of mine and do with them not. It's just simply the difference is one heeded God's word and one didn't. One said, God, I hear what you're saying and I'm going to act accordingly. And one didn't trust in the word of God. One didn't obey it. One didn't follow what God said. You know, you come to church, you hear a lot of the Bible. In our church, we, we're always short to preach the Bible and to talk about the Bible. But there's one thing to hear it, but it's another thing to obey it. There's a story of a man that said to Mark Twain, I am going, and this man was a man that was known for being ruthless, known for being ruthless in his business. But he said to Mark Twain, who wasn't a Christian at all, but he said to Mark Twain, I am going to go to Jerusalem and I am going to start, I'm going to go to Mount Sinai and I'm going to stand on the top of Mount Sinai and I'm going to read the Ten Commandments when I get to the top. Mark Twain said, I got a better idea for you. Why don't you stay here in Boston and keep them? Why don't you stay here and keep them? For us today, it's the same. Are you living by the word of God? We're just going through the book of Exodus. You're just through these pages about the Exodus. As we think of these plagues, let's not forget what we're to learn from them. There's some lessons here. God is great. God is holy. In God's word, that's our authority. Are you living by the word of God? Next week, we'll continue and we'll see three more, four more things. We'll see the love of God. We'll see the long suffering of God. We'll see the, I got to refresh myself on what that is. I have to do that throughout the week next week. But we'll see four more things as we consider the plagues of Egypt. But for today, I wonder, have you learned these lessons? Have you learned that God is our authority and we're to trust his word. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for the time we've spent in your word today. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us, Lord, to apply these truths to our hearts and minds, that we will live our lives by your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.